Good morning. My name is Muliadi. Today I'll be reading the scripture from 1 Corinthians 7, verse 1 through 5. I invite you to open your Bibles and read along with me. Principles for marriage. Now, concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer. But then come together again, so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. This is God's word. Amen. This is God's word. Um, fun fact, that was Muliati's first scripture reading. And so, uh, one of the go-to sex passages in the Bible. I, um, I titled this talk, um, this sermon, Sex to the Glory of God and as I was thinking about it, I don't love that title. I might call it having sex to the glory of God because I think we can glorify God by having sex or not having sex. But today's message is specifically um, about how does having sex in marriage glorify God? And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. And I know that as I, as I bring up this topic, some of you are like, yeah, preach it. You're excited. But some of you are apprehensive. And you're like, oh no, another church talk about sex. And so, you know, I want to acknowledge that for many of us, this is a difficult and potentially triggering topic. Uh, Sexual abuse has likely affected uh, a lot of us in some way, if not all of us in some way. And I hope that we can be a church that continues to grow in our ability to talk about sexual brokenness to be able to find safe relationships and safe places to where we can walk with each other in the hurts and the hangups and the dysfunctions that come, uh, that come up when we talk about sex. Uh, and some of those can be very painful. And so I am painfully aware of how my message will fall short in addressing those things Um, There's just a myriad of of issues that come alongside this issue of sex, and I will not be able to talk all of them. I'm going to focus on the glory of sex in marriage. That's what I want to do. I think that's what the scripture is saying. So I want to give a vision of that. Um, But what I do hope to do to help is I'm going to be bringing up my wife, Jamie, and she's going to share from uh, her own personal testimony about her journey, which is really our journey in this area of sex, just to give some reality to some of the things that um, I will be teaching on from this, from this passage. I also am aware that I am not a woman. And so uh, for some of the women here, you may be also uh, feeling like, oh no, another sex talk from a man. Uh, and so I want to say that I am indebted to uh, Sheila Gregory's book, The Great Sex Rescue, uh, and so I read this and found it to be super helpful. It is written from the, basically it is taking the woman's perspective about what it is like being a woman, a Christian woman in the church and, and engaging in this topic of sex. And, and kind of the main idea of the book is that there have been, the message from the church has been skewed pretty heavily towards the man's needs and his sexuality to the detriment and to the, I think the, probably the uh, not really understanding the woman's side, not really honoring the woman's sexual needs equally with the man's. So that's kind of the idea of that book. Uh, I found it very, uh, very helpful, and that's why we're going to do a gospel academy on that. So I invite you to come to that. I think it'll be very helpful. Uh, but unfortunately, what, what, what Gregory and her, she writes it with her t- two daughters, what they point out is that the passage I'm preaching on today is often used as a coercive text to kind of pressure and demand sex from a spouse in a way that is hurtful. But what I hope we see here is that 1 Corinthians chapter 7 presents the sexual needs of both the husband and the wife equally. 
It's one of the, the things that really stands out about this passage is how egalitarian Paul is in marriage. Both husband and wife are presented as equal uh, participants with equal needs and equal authority in the area of sex. Um, and so if you are married, I hope today's message inspires you to live this out faithfully in your marriage. I hope both husband and wife can say amen to what Paul is teaching here. To the unmarried seeking to get married, um, you need to know what you are signing up for if you continue on this path. We've been talking about abstaining from sexual immorality, and now finally, Paul's going to talk about you get to have sex, except what we're going to find is this, the passage is still challenging. It's not this kind of paradise of, of romanticism that we had hoped. Paul is... Um, Fairly straightforward and un almost unromantic and even a little subdued about, about marriage in general. So we're going to have to wrestle with that. And to all of us, I hope that by looking at what God calls married couples to in the area of sex, that it would teach all of us something about God's own love for each of us. So I want to start here in verse 7, verse, um, verse 1. Uh, now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. So the Corinthians um, seem to be moving away from sex. They think it's good. Somehow they've gotten this idea that maybe it's good to not get married and have sex. And what's interesting to me is Paul doesn't totally deny that. He basically says, you know what? Yeah, but no, for most of you, you need to have sex, but you raise a good point. You actually have a good question. And so what we're going to see is Paul is going to be very nuanced in this entire chapter. In chapter 5 and 6, Paul is uncompromising about sexual morality. But when it comes to sex in marriage, he's going to thread a needle, and what he's really doing um, is he's... He's going to say that in light of the kingdom of God, in light of kingdom building, the spiritual reality of God's people, that that is now the priority over family building, biological family building. And so Christians, you, we now need to keep uh, marriage in the right perspective, okay? So that perspective is that now we can serve the Lord being indwelt by his Holy Spirit. We just saw this last week. We are now a temple of the Holy Spirit. God, his presence is with us in the most profound way possible. And so because of that, some people are now supernaturally empowered to live joyfully without a spouse. And Paul wants us to consider that. And his, his view of marriage is that it's no sin to get married. That's about as excited as he gets about it. It's no sin. If you really, really need to, go for it. But for some of you, I would like you to consider a potentially better way. He says, if you get married, you do well. But if you can keep your desires in control and not get married, you will do even better. And so... Miguel will preach more on that next week to under, help us understand what is that better way. But what Paul gets to is he says, but for most of you, you ought to pursue marriage. And his reason is not very flattering. Um, he's going to say, uh, but verse 2, but because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. What Paul does here is he says, marriage is a provision against sexual immorality. That doesn't seem very inspiring to get married. That's the, is that our call in our lives to get married? Because I can't control my lusts. So I think some explanation is in order here that I think sets up the rest of the teaching. First of all, the way to see this is not that Paul is diminishing marriage by calling it a provision against sexual, sexual immorality, but it is continuing to show how big a deal sexual immorality is. That um, it does not diminish marriage as this beautiful picture of the gospel to also call it a provision against sexual immorality. That's how bad 
sexual immorality is. And so I think the foundation of that is actually in chapter 6. And I want to go back to chapter 6 just to bring in some theology to chapter 7 to help us understand it. Um, The key imperative in chapter 6 comes at the very end. After describing sexual morality and describing that we're at a, a, a temple of the Holy Spirit, Paul says this. He says, glorify God with your bodies. Glorify God with your bodies. And if you recall, um, you know, Andrew talked, to, he, he pointed out that we are now a temple of the Holy Spirit, which means we are an outpost of the presence of God in the world. We are a missionary outpost of the presence of God in the world. And what that means is the temple is a place where people come to meet and know God. So when Paul says glorify God with your bodies, he's saying the way you use your body sexually is saying something about God. Therefore, let it say what's true about God, right? Um, so when, when, when you, you, like, so he uses the example of the prostitute. He can't imagine Christians, um, having a prostitute because with a prostitute, right, you are paying money to selfishly take pleasure and you want nothing to do with that human being that you just took that from, you know, it's purely transactional and you want nothing to do with them aside from sex. And Paul is saying, how can you do that when God made you a temple of the Holy Spirit by paying a price of his precious blood? So you see the connection? Paying for a prostitute versus what God paid for? He paid to unite himself to you forever by his very blood. How could you now, being a, a temple of that, live in total contrast to that. And so what he is saying is, let the way you use your bodies in sex be a praise to the perfections of God's own covenant-keeping love. Let your celibacy be a poem to the all-satisfying and dwelling presence of God in your life. Let your sexuality be a sermon to the world about the sacrificial love of Jesus, your Savior. That's what it means when he says, glorify God with your bodies. You are saying something to the world now that you are united to him. You are saying something to the world about his love, about the way he died for you, and the way he united himself to you forever. And so it's no wonder that Paul has no problem calling marriage a provision against sexual immorality because each one are saying something about God. One is a slander of God's character. When Christians go around having sex indiscriminately, they are slandering the character of God who united himself to you by his blood forever. And he's saying, if you want to glorify God, you need to reflect that By uniting yourself to a spouse forever in a covenant, the way I have done with you. To do otherwise is to slander the character of God in your eyes and in all of our eyes. And we diminish the glory of God when sexual immorality is rampant among Christians. And so, Paul, they're just rivals. One slanders the glory of God and the other speaks to it. So, Paul says they're equal. Marriage is equal to sexual morality, and what they say about God positively or negatively. So that's the framework I want us to go into this passage, is that far from diminishing marriage, when he says, get married, he is saying, glorify God with your bodies, with sex, in marriage. It's a parable of the good news of the gospel. Um, So I want to examine that. What is the ways in which sex and marriage is a picture and demonstration of God living out his own covenant love? So verse 3, the husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourself to prayer, 
but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. You know, when we discuss this passage with the staff team, we kind of recognize at first glance, this kind of describes marriage, sex and marriage as a chore, right? Did you catch that language? Give to her her rights. The spouse has authority over your body. Do not deprive each other, right? As if the movement is away from sex. And so what, we're, what I'm saying is Paul does not use the language of desire and romance in this part of, of when he describes sex. And so what, what's that about? I think it's saying marriage is not supremely about your emotions or your desires. It's about promise keeping. It's about covenant keeping. Paul is using the language of what I'll refer to as covenant generosity. In other words, you, right, the language is give to your spouse. Do not deprive. You need to see your body as belonging to your spouse, right? To get married is to agree to making a covenant to steward your body according to the desires and needs of your spouse in sex and in all areas of life. And what is that a picture of? I think it's a picture of radical servanthood. It's sacrificial. It's generous. But you know what I think that is? I think that's normal Christian discipleship. That's what God calls Christians to do really in all areas of life. Jesus said it like this, I came not to be served, but to serve and give my life, literally his body broken for us as a ransom for all. And so Jesus' own example that of God's love is one of covenant generosity. God is promising to unite himself to us forever at the cost of the very blood of his son Jesus. And so we shouldn't be surprised when we're to apply what does it mean to be a follower of Christ in marriage. We shouldn't be surprised at what we find here in this passage. So here's what this means, that sex and marriage is a reflection of God's own covenant generosity towards his people. And so don't hear me say that God's relationship with his people is sexual. What I mean is that marriage is meant to say something about the character of God and the nature of our relationship with God as one of intimacy, faithfulness, and bondedness. And so the physical act of sex in marriage is a parable of the deeper and more glorious spirituality of God's love for us. So we may be able to, so that's kind of the theological framework I want us to have for what Paul is telling married couples to do. Why this language of give to them their rights, do not deprive. He's describing a picture of covenant generosity to fulfill what you have promised to your spouse. Um, and so what might happen at this point, a, con- a couple concerns is one, sex still feels like a chore that does, still doesn't sound necessarily fun. Isn't sex supposed to be fun? And also, it still, can this still be used to uh, be weaponized against a spouse to pressure and kind of coerce them into sex. Because look, God's word says, do not deprive me. So it should be sex on demand, right? If I want to have sex, a spouse ought to have sex. So I want to unpack this idea of covenant generosity and I want to say three things about it. What does covenant generosity mean? First of all, covenant generosity between husband and wife means sex must be mutually sacrificial. So again, let's notice how egalitarian Paul is when he talks about sex. It is both spouses are equally committed to the sexual needs and desires of their spouse. They are equally called to be generous. And notice it's give and not take. It's give, not take. And so the question is, can a spouse ever say no to sex? Is that okay for a Christian spouse under the the covenant call to serve their spouse? Can they ever say no? And so I like the way Sheila Gregory puts it. I think she nuances it just right. 
She says this, of course we have an obligation to each other in marriage when it comes to sex, but having an obligation to make sex a vital part of your marriage does not necessitate that we say yes to every single advance. Sex is not the only need in marriage relationships, and sometimes other needs take precedence. So I think that's right. That both spouses should be seeking to make sex a priority, make it a vital part, but there are other things going on in life that means that sometimes in that specific instance of desiring sex, it's best to abstain for one of the spouses. I think that is under the broader category of love. But I think we can see that even in this passage, right, where what, what I'm saying is covenant generosity means that both spouses see their, see their spouse's body as a kind of authority in their life. And so that's going to mean that sometimes, especially for the spouse with, that has the lower sex drive, right, it's the loving thing for them to do is to work to make themselves available to have sex, to work to be generous in that area. But for the spouse with the higher sex drive, it's going to mean sometimes when they realize their spouse isn't interested for various reasons, it's going to be, they're going to serve their spouse with their bodies by joyfully abstaining. And I want to say this, can, this is difficult. In fact, when, it, when, the, when the passage says that um, do not deprive each other except by agreement. That word for agreement is the same word that we get the word symphony. And so the idea is that the sex act over the course of your marriage ought to be this beautiful coordinated symphony where you are enjoying each other in a way that is mutually satisfying, including with your frequency. And let me tell you, it is difficult to get to that, to that symphony and to that uh, symmetry in your marriage. It's going to require communication, compassion, forgiveness, but that is the goal. That is the picture of a mutually sacrificial that both spouses are working. Some are going to give a little more, and some are going to abstain a little more than they might want, but it's to mutually serve each other. So that's going to help us with the question of, can this be used to weaponize and pressure a spouse to having sex on demand, and I hope I've shown no. That's not what Paul is meaning here. If both spouses are seeking to show covenant generosity, both to give and to abstain, need to be a part of that equation. But how about, how about the chore part? This is supposed to be fun as well, and so, yes, covenant generosity between husband and wife means sex should be mutually pleasurable. Paul says, do not deprive one another. You know what that's communicating? That's communicating that both spouses have sexual needs. Paul's very clear, do not deprive both spouses, the husband and the wife, have sexual needs. And again, Sheila Gregory asks a great question at this point in her book. She's asking, do not deprive a spouse of what? Do not deprive your wife of what exactly? Is it intercourse? Is it his ejaculation? Is that what we're not depriving the spouse in marriage of? Just get it done? Listen to this in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 32 and 34. Paul's saying this, I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife. And his interests are divided. And the unmarried and or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. And so first of all, let us see how, how countercultural this is to patriarchal culture. Both husband and wife equally in all areas of life seeking to know and be anxious how to please each other. So this is not a picture of the husband going to work, working hard, and coming home, and the wife needs to serve him hand and foot. Both spouses equally attentive to the needs of the other in all areas of life all the time. That's why Paul says, this is hard. 
And some of you may want to consider not entering into that kind of covenant. It makes you anxious about, I mean, could you imagine having to care about the needs of your spouse in all areas of life for the rest of your life? Paul's trying to say, yeah, that's, that's rough. It's beautiful in some ways, but he doesn't want to blunt the difficulty of that. But I want, do you hear though what he did, his vision of marriage is? Each spouse is concerned about how to please the other spouse. Do you think Paul had an exception with sex on that? Do you think he's saying, I want you to know how to please your wife, except with sex? Just on that case, it's all about you, brother. No, both spouses are interested in doing this. Both spouses are caring about this. So I want to um, take a look here at Song of Solomon. Can't have a talk about sex without quoting a passage here. It's the very last verse, verse 14, verse chapter 8, verse 14. This is the woman speaking. Make haste, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountain of spices. Make haste. Do you see how empowered the woman is in her relationship? She is eager for sex. She is calling on her husband She is expectant of pleasure. Come and be like a a stag on the mountain of spices. There are treasures to be had up here, my love. Come and get them. Let's enjoy them together. This This is the woman. Now, what I appreciate about this analogy is she refers to the sex act as a mountain. Mountains are hard to climb. Mountains are difficult, which, by the way, is the only reason they're worth climbing. If they were not difficult, no one would care about climbing them. But notice that she says, I want you to be like a gazelle or a stag. Have you ever, you know, mountains are difficult to climb for human beings. Have you ever seen a deer climb a mountain? Easily. They are designed to climb mountains. They bound and leap as if gravity does not exist. So what she's saying is, she's saying, look, I know, I know my body is hard. I know pleasure and sex is hard, but I want it to be easy for you. I want you to be, I want you to know me so well. I'm inviting you to know me so well that it's like you were designed just for me. And while my body is difficult and pleasure is difficult for us, we're going to be like a deer on a mountain. Bounding and leaping and experiencing the mountaintops together. That's what scripture says can happen between a loving husband and a loving wife. And yes, there are many things that can interfere with that. But I want to present the picture that, the, that scripture gives of mutual pleasure between a husband and wife. You know, there's a, a Bev Weens who is the... Uh, she is a director of counseling at Western Seminary. She's the chair. I was listening to her talk on the theology of sex, and she makes this point that there is this cry in Scripture that we, we ask God to search me and know me. The picture of the gospel is that we open ourselves up in the most intimate and vulnerable ways that we would be ashamed to allow anyone into and, and yet we invite God and his love and his compassion and we enter into a relationship with God. Search me and know me. It's a picture of complete vulnerability and intimacy before God. And she says, that's what pleasure is about in sex. It's about two people saying, search me and know me. I am naked and unashamed before you. I am vulnerable before you. And the call of covenant love and covenant generosity is to take that spouse's openness to you, take what God has brought you to together and approach it with generosity, with compassion, with understanding, with energy, with joy. And both, so both couples desiring to do that together. So covenant generosity means sex and marriage is mutually pleasurable. And my last point here is that covenant generosity between husband and wife means uh, means sex must be prioritized. 
And so we were going to remember as we look at this passage that it's very unromantic, straightforward, almost legal language. And you know, I've just come to appreciate that over the years of being married, 17 years of being married. Um, which isn't even that long compared to many of us here, but life, you know, if, um, you know, emotions are emotions of love and romance and strong desires for sex and strong, those wax and wane in life, right? And life can take dramatic turns, ambitions can go unchecked, children and busyness can creep in on us. And so what Paul is saying here is this passage is forcing married couples to not let the pressures and pains of life become a wedge between you and your spouse. Stay intimate. That is what covenant love does. When, we, when life gets hard for us, how do we want to feel towards God? We want to feel close to him. We want to invite God closer to us when life gets hard. That's what covenant love is about. When life gets difficult, we lean into each other. Married couples are to prioritize sex, prioritize intimacy. That is what covenant love is about. This does not mean if sexual intimacy is a struggle in your marriage, you are justified in having an adultery, you are justified at looking at porn or being unfaithful or passive aggressive, yet we can't blunt the truth that if you leave yourselves, you are leaving yourselves more vulnerable to Satan if you are not prioritizing sex and you each have responsibility. We can't blunt that truth to prevent Satan from getting a foothold hold by letting other things other things in life, even good things, be a wedge between you. Now, there are reasons to abstain from sex, even over an extended period of time, but it needs to be by agreement. It needs to be something you both are talking about. Um, and so what I want to do uh, is I want to bring Jamie up. Because I've talked a lot about the, the teaching of what this means, what this, what this is about biblically, but what might this look like? And so... Um, I asked Jamie to share. She has courageously been willing to share. Yeah, this, this is not like giving um, the Solano Life announcements. <laughs> it's not the same. Yeah, so uh, Paul referenced Sheila Gregory, Gregory, and she wrote The Great Sex Rescue. So I just want to platform that book, say that that is well worth reading. I think that the reality of making sex a vital part of marriage is sometimes just a bigger uphill battle for one spouse more than another. Um, and so even if you believe that that's true and you walk into marriage, just like, yes, that's true. And it's, a, it's your desired necessity, your outcome. There are just some roadblocks. Um, and so I think like if your body is a temple, sometimes there are just like boulders and weeds at the entrance, right? Like there's just things that get in the way. Paul, Paul referenced that. So when we got married, I didn't really have a sexual past. You know, I had not been uh, physically or sexually assaulted or abused or anything like that. So I had fairly high hopes, right, entering marriage. I'm like, yeah. But um, I also knew, like, I had grown up with enough honesty from people to know that it was, um, this is not going to be a cakewalk, right? Like, people talk about how this is, yeah, we learn each other and communicate and people fight about sex, all the sex and money, that's what you fight about. And I was like, okay, so it's not going to be easy, check, um, and it wasn't easy. <laughs> That's no joke. Um, so for several years, I think we, like most couples, kind of struggled to figure out um, what, what's going on. You know, who, who are you? Who am I? What's, what's happening? Um, and I had, I had just some seasons of physical discomfort in sex. I just didn't understand why. Um, it was really confusing. Uh, Paul... Uh, I, I think we were also kind of early married, growing up in marriage together during um, like Mars Hill stuff. Like Christian culture was saying a lot of things about sex and really powerful statements about it all the time. Um, 
It was just lots of confusion. We didn't really crack the nut on that mutuality piece. Um, you know, we, um, it was just kind of hard. I would often feel this like just lack of desire, um, just a lack of really being able to say yes. And it wasn't that I didn't want to say yes. I did want to say yes. I really wanted to say yes, but I just couldn't. And I could not like muster that. That's not something you can like pick yourself up on your bootstraps and just kind of like make yourself, you know, that is not a make yourself situation, right? And I just didn't know what, and, and it wasn't even all bad, right? Like it's not like, oh, everything was awful all the time. It wasn't. It was often really great. And we would have, um, you know, great seasons. And then every year I felt like it would just get better and better. And we generally had a lot of hope on this, like, better and better, but Paul, <laughs> Paul's so great, but you know, in some ways he's not. And so I think that <laughs> he often really blew it and admittedly so, right? Like he would accuse me of being lazy um, or like not understanding him or not caring about him and like what's going on with him. And I'm like, I'm not lazy in any other aspect of my life. You know, that's not how anyone describes me. I love Paul. Like, what gives? Um, I would often feel really guilty. I'd feel like heavy pressure. I'd feel really inadequate. And then we had kids, right? Like, this is all pre-kid, like the easy part. <laughs> then we had kids. And so, you know, that's, everyone knows, like, sex when you're newly, new parents, there's no, no walk in the park, right? Shouldn't be walking in the park. Um, It's a curveball, right? Um, between stitches, C-sections, exhaustion, hormones, um, you know, just conflict. You have new sources of conflict all of a sudden. I had three of them, right? Um, and, and, and still, still, right? Things were getting better year after year. And so I, I thought this was just kind of in the realm of like, it's normal. This is all normal stuff, what I'm experiencing. And I think you hear women talk here and there. And so I just was like, okay. Um, we just kind of moved forward. I knew that Paul would be hurt when I said no, um, and I wanted to say yes. I didn't want him to feel rejected. I don't want that. Uh, but I knew that he did. Um, I knew he, I, I kind of had to trust that he wanted to really be with me. It was really hard for me to be like, eh, you know, I just had this like bad attitude about like his own, the purity of his desire. It was weird. Um, and I would just vacillate between going for it, and then having to deal with like a negative emotional outcome at the end, um, or saying no, and then feeling like really guilty. And Paul did not make that better often, so. Um, I just thought this was normal. It was getting better, seasons are good, seasons are hard, it's life. But a, a friend of mine once said that we're like onions, right? Like we have layers of brokenness, and sometimes, I hate onion illustrations, I'm sorry, but like sometimes you have, all the, you're, you have all the layers, right? But God does not choose to heal you um, all, all the way, all the time. He waits, right? He waits until he's good and ready to heal that layer. And then he does it. There's nothing you can do about it, right? So uh, about a year after Ben was born, so here I've got like three kids under five at that point, God just stepped in. He's like, this is the time. We're going to do this layer now. And it's like a big layer. So in a really hard way, God forced me to like deal with this. And I didn't even know what this was. I didn't know I had like a big problem. So um, yeah, uh, as many of you know, Paul and I were, are, I am, are still present tense, but we worked on college campuses with, um, college students. So we like, we were missionaries with crew for college students. And so, um, you're working with college students. It's, it's fraught with, um, students walking through all kinds of sexual brokenness. And so after 10, um, 12 years of being on campus, I would say that on average, I would have a close up, um, experience with a girl who is dealing with some sort of sexual uh, assault or abuse or rape or something, about on average, about once a year. And then this year, 
that I'm talking about, um, like 2015, 2014, I had multiple girls come to me with very, very recent rape experiences. And it was like, boom, boom, boom. Like several girls that really cared about these women. And then um, that Christmas, I was at home um, with family. And a family member, like very casually, just offhandedly said that she had been raped by someone who, when I was a child, she had been raped by somebody that I knew really well and who had been a part of my childhood. And I was like, whoa. Like, I, I was right there. Like, what happened? And then um, a few days, so I was like, I was kind of reeling. I was just in shock. And then a few days later, we went to our crew winter conference. And I was told that one of our very sweet little freshman girls had been raped on Christmas Eve by a friend of a friend, and she was actually at the conference. And so, of course, me, like, campus director woman, like, I need to go in and, like, speak with her and, like, help her take whatever next step, whatever, whatever that looks like. And so, of course, I do. I love her. But I'm not in a good spot on this. Um, and I, it's really hard to even talk about. Um, I, I tapped out. Like, I just... I was done. I was like in a very, very, very dark spiral and I like hit the ground hard. I couldn't function, like I couldn't breathe, which is really, really, like very basic functioning things like taking care of Ben, very overwhelmingly difficult. Um, and my friends were asking, they're like, are you okay? I'm like, I am not okay. I am not okay. Like something, I hit the ground hard. I don't know why, I don't know what's happening. Like. Something's not right. And so, of course, I go to counseling. I'm like, I got to get a counselor. Uh, good move. So um, I went to a counselor. And I remember the first week sitting in her office. And, like, I couldn't even, like, lift my shoulders. I couldn't. I couldn't. Like, I had so much tension. It was debilitating. Um, and we just started going through counseling. And I realized that I was not just carrying trauma from these girls or family members or whatever, I, I was tacking on everyone's trauma. I was like, Polly Class, Elizabeth Smart, Amanda Berry, Tamar, all the human trafficking, all the rape, all the abuse. I was like, I just felt like it was like on top of me all the time. From the moment I woke up, from the moment I went to bed, the whole thing. Um, it was awful. And I realized that um, even though I had never been a primary victim of abuse, I had, I had seen so much abuse. Um, when I was a kid, <laughs> I saw Fatal Attraction in movie theaters when I was six years old. That is a trip and a half, right? Like there's adultery, she shoot, he shoots her in a bathtub, they boil a rabbit. Like that's not a movie for young children, right? I remember going through all the movies I saw and all the horrific like rape scenes I saw. Boom, boom, boom. In theaters, I'm like, what were my parents thinking? And I, I think that was actually a little bit more common in the 80s. I don't know, but it's a problem. So never like porn, right? But just movies. I mean, even shoot, Downton Abbey, right? There's a rape scene in Downton Abbey. Not even Downton Abbey is safe. Um, it just was everywhere. And one day I had a full on panic attack watching this woman almost get raped on TV. And I'm like, I can't, I can't do this. And so I realized the whole point of what I'm saying is, is I realized that I was coming into our marriage very handicapped in this area. I didn't even know. My feelings of safety were like, horribly shot. You know, if, if, if a woman, if somebody needs to feel safe to be that vulnerable, I didn't really have that. I was really suspicious of sex. You know, when you, these things kind of wire you a little bit, right? Your heart, your mind, you're wired to associate sex with not feeling safe. It's not committed. You know, it's, it's just, ugh, right? So no matter how great Paul was, there is no way that he was going to be able to just make this go away, right? This wasn't just on him to, like, fix it. And so in counseling, I would um, go, and she would give me homework assignments, like writing 
letters to my childhood self. Sounds so cheesy, but so good. Um, Writing healing messages to myself as a child. Like, what would I want to say to myself as a child? Um, What is the truth about sex? What would I want to say to my junior high self, right, when I had, like, weird things happen, stupid boys, right? Like, what would I have wanted to have heard? And so it just this process, and I remember, like, I would paint pictures of Jesus being present in all of those moments. And, and he was there. He was fully, fully there. And, and spending time in God's word and spending time uh, talking about this with Paul. So like every time after my appointment, Paul would prioritize like an hour to rehash the appointment with me, right? And he would, um, I would just tell him everything that I thought through. Like he really made that time sacred, um, and we would, I had friends I was talking to about it. Um, after six months, I was in one of my last appointments, and I realized that I, I could breathe. Like, my shoulders were light. My jaw had no tension in it. And I realized God had done a real healing work. I didn't think about, um, I, I felt safe. I just felt safe. And I, I think about, like, Jesus carries us, right? Like you think about if you're walking with him, like you're on a donkey, right? Have you, yeah, on a horse or an elephant or whatever. And if you are carrying a backpack and you're on a donkey, it doesn't matter to the donkey if you carry the backpack or if you put the backpack on the donkey. It's the same. It doesn't matter to him. So I just realized like I don't have to carry this anymore. He can carry this. I do not have to carry this. Um, I just want to highlight This process was not easy. Like that kind of, I didn't even know I had a problem, right? And then I go in, it's six months. Uh, On average, that's like $100 a session. It's like $2,400 out the door. That's a significant investment. The time, we had young kids, we had childcare, on and on and on. So Paul was just very eager to be like, yes, whatever you need, I am here to give it to you. And I did. It just made such a dramatic difference. I, I look at that as like, oh, Jamie broke, and then Jamie got rehealed and, and remade into something that I feel safe. I feel confident. Um, I think that I don't, I don't struggle with that, that guilt. Oh, and Paul fully apologized for like all the crappy things that he'd ever said to me and realized like he had more empathy for me. He finally understood there was like not this confusion. Why is Jamie like this? Oh, this is why. Um, There's nothing wrong with me, right? Um, And so I think that it's just made a huge difference. Mutuality for the win. Um, Prioritizing this. I feel confident saying no because I've, I've, I've made the yes so clear. Like, I've, I've, this is my priority, right? And I think Paul's felt really loved by that. I don't have a great way to end this, so you can come up any time, but um, <laughs> I'm done. But anyway, thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Um, yeah, I, I wanted um, her to share that because Part of it was some of my own story and some of my uh, struggles as a husband to understand my wife. And, and it's just, I, I'm grieved by how quickly I pushed the something's wrong with you button and told her that. Um, and so my encouragement, spouses, is in the area of sex, this is deep stuff. There's, n- there's not simple answers. And it's a call to learn each other, understand each other, show compassion, um, and, and some of it's not your fault, like Jamie made the point, you know, it, not, there's nothing I could have done or she could, we didn't even know it was there. There was just stuff buried. And I would even argue, you know, especially for women in a, in a sexualized culture, um, uh, it is much harder for women to feel safe in the area of sex than men, which affects them much more deeply. It's not to say there's not brokenness with men as well. Um, but you know, guys, I'm a, it's, we're, we're running a little late, so I'm going to jump to our prayer time. We're going we're gonna to wrap this up. And so, uh, over the last three weeks, we've been talking about sex, sexual immorality, and so this is the time for you to respond in prayer. We're going to invite the prayer team to come up after John leads us in communion, and just some things to th- think about is how have you experienced, uh, what, um, uh, how has your experience with sex or marriage caused brokenness? 
As you just think about the area of marriage and sex, where is this, where is there brokenness? And, and come and receive prayer about that. And if you don't feel comfortable doing that here in front of people, have someone to pray with about that. What are you asking God for related to marriage? What are your hopes and dreams about marriage um, that you want to bring and, 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 and cast your anxieties over to God or, or, or make sure you're trusting him with it? And how is God calling you to reflect his covenant love to the world with your bodies? All of us uh, are called to glorify God if we're believers in Jesus to glorify God with our bodies and how is God calling you to do that in your area of life so let me pray Lord um, would you just take the words uh, spoken here today uh, through your scriptures through the sermon through the testimony and Lord help us to um, embrace the calling of marriage uh, for those of us who are married or seeking marriage, Lord, that we would uh, see it as an act of, of generous covenant keeping, uh, covenant generosity, which is a reflection of your generosity, Lord. And would all of us um, look at sex as a picture of your amazing love for us, your covenant love for us, that you are sacrificial, you are faithful, um, Lord, you... Um, uh, never w walk away from us. When things get hard, you le lean in, and we are your forever priority. Uh, and Lord, and so would, would we all turn to you as the source of our greatest joy and our greatest fulfillment. And Lord, would you be with married couples? Satan wants to attack them, wants to bring them down. And Lord, would you help them to navigate this area, navigate their, their marriages in a way that glorifies you. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.